Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. You probably know by now that we study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series is a very interesting series on the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah has been having a lot of problems already in the first few lessons. This is lesson number five entitled, More Woes for the Prophet. It's the lesson for October 31 of 2015. I hope you have your Bible handy because you might want to check on some of the things we look at here. But um, in any case, we'd like to ask you to bow your head with, uh, heads with us so that we can pray together as we start. Our kind and wonderful Father, we thank you so much for your word which is spread out before us. Help us to somehow comprehend the situation in Jeremiah's day and why he would say what he did and why you said what you did is to all those people in their wicked ways and their determination to run from you and rebel against you. Help us to know how we can deal with those who want to do that in our day as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I, it's getting to be almost like a broken record here. We're going to discuss more problems that Jeremiah had from the opposition and persecution that he received from his fellow Jews. Which reminds me of a verse in the New Testament. A couple of verses together. 2 Timothy 3, 12 and 13. Everyone who wants to live a godly life in union with Christ Jesus will be persecuted. How many of you have been persecuted this week? Hmm. And evil persons and impostors will keep on going from bad to worse, deceiving others and being deceived themselves. Wow. Have you ever been attacked or have you ever suffered because of your Christian beliefs? Now, I'm not talking about anybody who's living in uh, Syria right now, but uh, how about that? I know if you put any of your beliefs online, you can get persecuted pretty quickly because <laughs> people, there's no name behind the the comment. So I know it's very, people get very discouraged stating their beliefs online because there's a lot of negative consequences to doing so. So do you think that's an excuse why we shouldn't do it? Do we dare say things that we think correctly represent the Bible here in this class? We'd better say what's correct. <laughs> Well, what does it say here in Second Timothy three? One of the things is slanderers. If you tell, don't tell the truth about God, aren't you? And then Romans three, what thirty? Same thing, slanderers. Mm -hmm. What was Lucifer doing in heaven? Slandering. What did Moses do when he struck the rock the second time? When he was told to speak to the rock, he was misrepresenting God. So it's, mm -hmm. that's pretty high on the pecking order of of sins, isn't it? Yeah. Well, Jeremiah became so discouraged in this lesson that he wanted to die. He even prayed, God, I wish I had died in my mother's womb. Have any of you prayed that? That's uh, depression. Should we, I mean, we read the verse there. Should we really expect to suffer persecution since we're in the middle of the great controversy? Is that a part of the great controversy? You know, given. W when you say persecution, I'm, my my I didn't say it. My question, well, my question is, what degree are you talking about? Well, it was so serious in Jeremiah's day that he wanted to die, wanted to die. Because I felt I felt like I've been persecuted several times, okay. but not to that extent. Okay. Well, but, but yeah. I, I seems to me like the Bible is full of promises that if you're doing the right thing, God is going to protect you. There's some of it's that. Going to, you're going to be uh, live in a land filled with milk and honey, and uh, the bees are going to take care of all these people that are wanting to persecute you, <laughs> and so on and so forth. So, um, Well, <clears throat> I think if you look at the current events, and you and I'm talking now in this country, we still have freedom of religion, just. 
just, just, they're already just, nibbling at it. It's in just, very uh, much. Just because I'm being persecuted, that doesn't mean I'm not still prosperous. No, doesn't. Just because I have enemies. I mean, isn't that what Psalms 23 is about? Yeah. You know, David's got these people that are after him, and it's all right. Okay. The Lord sets out a, uh, a table in front of his enemies, and uh, he feasts, and... <laughs> well, my point is that I, sometimes I do, I have felt like I've been persecuted, but what keeps me from even mentioning it, mean it is it's nothing anywhere near Jeremiah's persecution mm -hmm. or even the apostles, some of their persecution. Do you think? And so I don't even want to mention it, you know? <laughs> Jeremiah lived 2,500 years ago. Do you think we can really understand his situation? What do you mean by that question? Yes, I think you can. Well, I mean, maybe his, the, he was, things were so different in his day that we're just wasting time trying to really understand it. When I see what happens to some of these people in these Muslim countries, some of these Christians, yeah. that's pretty tough. Yeah. Yeah. Well, culture has a lot to do with understanding it, that for, that's for sure. But if you look at it as a human, you know, as a fellow human, you can probably understand a little bit of what he's well, let's going pick, through. Let's pick a few words from Jeremiah. Look at Jeremiah 23, verses 14 and 15. <clears throat> but I have seen the prophets in Jerusalem do even worse. He's talked about some pretty bad things. They commit adultery and tell lies. They help people do wrong so that no one stops doing what is evil. To me, they are all as bad as the people of Sodom and Gomorrah. It's a nice, cheerful message, right? Read the next verse. Uh, so then, this is what I, the Lord Almighty, say about the prophets of Jerusalem. I will give them bitter plants to eat and poison to drink because they have spread ungodliness throughout all the land. Is God, uh, does God do that kind of stuff? Well, look at Jer back to chapter 5, <coughs> verses 26 to 31. Evildoers live among my people. They lie in wait like those who spread nets to catch birds but they have set their traps to catch people. Just as a hunter fills a cage with birds, they have filled their houses with loot. That is why they are powerful and rich, why they are fat and well-fed. There is no limit to their evil deeds. They do not give orphans their rights and show justice to the oppressed. But I, the Lord, will punish them for these things. I will take revenge on this nation. A terrible and shocking thing has happened in the land. Prophets speak nothing but lies. Priests rule as a prophet's command, and my people offer no objections. But what will they do when it all comes to an end? Yeah, verse uh, 12 of uh, chapter 5. They have spoken falsely of the Lord. They have said, he will do nothing. So forth. Then you get over to Jeremiah 8, 8, and the scribes. He's condemning the scribes because the scribes say, we have the law. The law is with us. But they made it into a lie. Mm-hmm. So what are these folks supposed to do to offer their objections? They withhold their tithe and offerings? Is that a legitimate thing to... Well, what, what did Jeremiah did? Jeremiah stood outside the temple, waited till people were on their way to the temple, and he says, and he did his preaching. You do that where I go to church and they call the police on you. Yeah. Some people do that. <laughs> well... Isn't a prophet supposed Shouldn't, to be... How yeah. do I know I'm not supposed to listen to those people? Maybe you are. See what they have to say. Isn't a prophet supposed to be a spokesperson for God? Yep. Aren't the priests supposed to have the job of teaching others the truth about God? Yep. <clears throat> so how can we have prophets lying and committing adultery and leading the priests to do exactly the same things? How could things have deteriorated so badly? Well, this world has aligned itself against God, and so the people that represent Him, it's easy to see why they would get prosecuted so, uh, persecuted so easily. Yeah. Well, in Jeremiah 25 and 29, two places it says, Jeremiah has already predicted that they will be in captivity for 70 years. So what was the response? Well, look at Jeremiah 28, the first four verses. 
That same year, in the fifth month of the fourth year that Zedekiah was king, Hananiah, son of Azar, a prophet from the town of Gibeon, spoke to me in the temple. Now here's a person claiming to be a prophet speaking in the temple. In the presence of the priests and of the people, he told me that the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, had said, I have broken the power of the king of Babylon. Within two years, I will bring back to this place all the temple treasures that King Nebuchadnezzar took to Babylonia. I will also bring back the king of Judah, Jehoiachin, son of Jehoiakim, along with all the people of Judah who went into exile in Babylonia. Yes, I will break the power of the king of Babylonia. I, the Lord, have spoken. Wouldn't you want to believe a message like that? Probably why it was easy to preach. That's a message they wanted to hear. Mm -hmm. message they wanted to embrace something like that. Of health, wealth, and uh, have what you want. Well, <laughs> down to verse 10. Then Hananiah took the yoke off my neck, broke it in pieces, and said in the presence of all the people, the Lord has said that this is how he will break the yoke that King Nebuchadnezzar has put on the neck of all the nations and he will do this within two years. Then I left. So Jeremiah walked out. Sometime after this, the Lord told me to go and say to Hananiah, the Lord has said that you may be able to break a wooden yoke, but he will replace it with an iron yoke. The Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, has said that he will put an iron yoke on all these nations and they will serve King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylonia. The Lord has said that he will make even the wild animals serve Nebuchadnezzar. Then I told Hananiah this and added, Listen, Hananiah, the Lord did not send you, and you are making these people believe a lie. And so the Lord himself says that he's going to get rid of you. Before this year is over, you will die because you've told the people to rebel against the Lord. And Hannah died. Hananiah died in the seventh month of that same year. So now who are you going to believe? What you want to believe or... What turns out to be the truth? Well, when people continue to refuse God's generous offers, what's he supposed to do? Give them up. Give them up. And what do we call that when God gives people up? God's wrath. God's, God's anger. wrath. And it talks about it right here in Jeremiah, God's wrath. And it says it has to do with his giving them up. Well, as we know, the prophet's job is to give God's messages and not just to do the popular thing. Jeremiah was certainly not one whose guiding light was to be politically correct. Think about Noah and uh, some of the other groups down through biblical history. Even in Revelation 12, 17, at the very end, this is a familiar verse to Adventists, but let's read it one more time. The dragon was furious. Who does the dragon represent? Who is the dragon in this passage? Back up in verse 9 it says, The dragon was furious with the woman and went off to fight against the rest of her descendants. The rest of her descendants. What does that mean? The few who are left over, right? All those who obey God's commandments and are faithful to the truth revealed by Jesus. Well, look at Jeremiah 20, 1 to 6. I don't know how many of these passages we need to read in detail. When the priest Pasher, son of Immer, who was the chief officer of the temple, heard me proclaim these things, we're going to talk about what those, th what those things are in a moment, he ordered me to be beaten and placed in chains near the upper Benjamin gate in the temple. The next morning, after Pasher had released me from the chains, I said to him, The Lord did not name you, Pasher. The Lord, the name he has given you is terror everywhere. Wouldn't you like to be called terror everywhere? The Lord himself has said, I am going to make you a terror to yourself and to your friends, and you will see them all killed by the sword of their enemies. I am going to put all the people of Judah under the power of the king of Babylonia. He will take some away as prisoners to his country and put others to death and a whole list of, of, of problems there. So why would they be, why would this priest be so upset by Jeremiah? Surely it wasn't something that Jeremiah said, would it be? Not exactly what he wanted to hear. Well, look at the previous chapter, Jeremiah 19. Just read verses 4 to 9. 
I am going to do this because the people have, this is God talking, but the people have abandoned me. Okay, what happens first? People the people have abandoned me and defiled this place by offering sacrifices here to other gods. Gods that neither they nor, they nor their ancestors nor the kings of Judah have known anything about. They have filled this place with the blood of innocent people and they have built altars for Baal in order to burn their children in the fire as sacrifices. Okay, how far have they gone? Offering human sacrifices. Mm -hmm. The children. enemy will surround the city and try to kill its people. The siege will be so terrible that the people inside the city will eat one another, even their own children. And if we had a chance to go back and read the rest of the chapter, it will, it will describe what's happening there as God's wrath. They abandon him, and what does God do? So He lets them go. So why, why was this priest, and why were these prophets, and why was the king, and why were they resisting this message that <clears throat> this is going to happen for 70 years. Why didn't they just go ahead? What was the, why didn't they just suppose, go ahead? And wh I, what were they going to lose by, by accepting Jeremiah's predictions here? If I come to your house tomorrow morning and knock on the door, and you come to the door and I say, guess what? You're going to be a slave for the next 70 years. You're going to say, hallelujah, right? Well, <clears throat> I might say, well, this is because my ways are evil, <laughs> and if I change my ways, I can change that. So, so what happens here? Pasher hears this message. He doesn't like it. So what do you do? You punish the messenger, right? You can't reach God. So what do you do? You punish the messenger, right? So he, he tries to follow God's directions. Back in Deuteronomy 25, look at this. Suppose two Israelites go to court to settle a dispute and one is declared innocent and the other guilty. If the guilty person is sentenced to be beaten, the judge is to make him lie face downwards and have him whipped. The number of lashes will depend on the crime he has committed. He may be given as many as 40 lashes, but no more. More than that, more than that would humiliate him publicly. So, is that what Jeremiah got? Well, after being released from the stocks, Jeremiah announced a God-given message against Pasher and his family as recorded in Jeremiah 20, verses 3 to 6. Let's look at that. That next morning after Pasher released me from the chains, I said to him, The Lord did not name you, Pasher. We read that part already. I'm going to put all the people of Judah under the power of the king of Babylonia, etc. So what does Jeremiah do? He goes back to saying the same thing again. Right? What does God wants it, want us to do if we receive a message of rebuke? He wants us to cooperate. No. And how would cooperating have helped these people? Fifty days after Passover weekend when Jesus died, was killed, Peter gave a sermon. And what was their response? What should we do? Isn't that what God wants us to respond? Well, fortunately, not all of Pasher's descendants were in bad shape. It turns out, if we go back to Nehemiah 7, verse 41, how many descendants of Pasher came back to Jerusalem? 1,247. That's pretty remarkable, huh? So some learned their lesson. Some learned their lesson. Well, we need to make a note of something that makes the book of Jeremiah more difficult to understand. And this is, this is not in your regular lesson, so don't try to find it in the Sabbath school. I just I wanted to add it here because it, I think it helps us to understand what's going on. The book of Jeremiah was destroyed and then rewritten as Jeremiah remembered parts of it. It is not in chronological order. If the book of Jeremiah were organized chronologically and compared with the reigns of the kings of Judah, it would be something like this. 
Manasseh, who reigned from 696 to, or 695 down to 642, Jeremiah was born around 645. So when Manasseh died, Jeremiah was roughly five years old. Amon, Manasseh's son, ruled for only two years. Okay? Then Josiah comes along. He reigns for 31 years. And those are the early years when, quite, well, the early books of Jeremiah, anyway, were written. Jeremiah 1 to 6, Jeremiah 14 to 16. Then Jehoahaz was, was placed on the throne. He reigned only three months, and we don't have any evidence that anything was written by Jeremiah during those three months. Then there was Jehoiakim. He reigned from 609 to 598, so 11 years. And we have Jeremiah 17, 7 to 11, 26, 35, 22, 25, 18 to 20, 36 parts of 36, several parts of 36, and then chapter 12. So there's quite a jumble of, of chapters here. Then Jehoiachin. Jeremiah wrote chap the rest of chapter 22, 13, and 23. That was a, a period of about one year. Then in Zedekiah, the last king of Judah, Jeremiah wrote chapter 24, 29 to 31, 46 to 51, 27, 28, 21, 34, 32, 33, and 37 to 39. What, what you're saying here is that uh, somewhere along the line, the chronological assemblage of Jeremiah's material has gotten jumbled. Yes. Wouldn't it, wouldn't it be appropriate then? We're, I'm inquiring about biblical scholarship and mm -hmm. biblical translation. Wouldn't it be appropriate for those who do that? kind of work and, and provide put our trans back to put it back put it back in a chronological it, order. That's right. So when we got the Bible we would it would be few, as right. as Jeremiah would have intended it. So why don't they why don't Some they Some people have tried that. Mm -hmm. Four or five there's four or five chronological Bibles. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that would be they don't want to tinker with the scriptures as we have them, but they'll come up with uh, an auxiliary material where you could where you could do that. And then finally, after the fall of Jerusalem, finally Jerusalem is besieged for those several years and just completely destroyed, Jeremiah 40 through 44 and 52. Finally then, sometime down around, around 580 B.C., Jeremiah dies down in Egypt. That's not all. It becomes even more complicated because adding to this problem, the Septuagint, the very earliest translation of the Old Testament from Hebrew into Greek leaves out one eighth of the book, leaves it out completely, and places the prophecies against the nations from Jeremiah 46 to 51 after Jeremiah 25 to 13. So, why did they do that? And the answer is nobody knows. Confused. So, if you find our study lessons jumping around a little bit, you might understand a little bit better why that happened. And those people that did that, you call scribes, <laughs> who made it into a lie. You think I, that? I got one for you. Just, it just came to mind. Uh, remember in Ezekiel 20, 25, and 26, somebody grabbed that. And it says, it caused their uh, firstborn to go th through the uh, fires, okay? Mm -hmm. Jeremiah 19, 5. Uh, have built the high places of Baal to burn their sons in the fire as burnt offerings to Baal, which I did not command them. So right in the same, in two, two books, right next to each other, or not, well, close next to Jeremiah's uh, Lamentations between, but it just contradicts us. So what, which side are we going to come down on? Yeah. We have a problem with Bible translation. Yeah. Well, it, my Good News Bible says, then I gave them, this is Ezekiel 20, verse 25, then I gave them laws that are not good, and commands that do not bring life. I let them, that's what the Hebrew says, I let them defile themselves with their own offerings, I let them sacrifice their firstborn sons, this was to punish them and show that I am the Lord. Now that, that, that part's, oh, the latter part of that is, is just fine because I let them or I gave yeah. them over to laws, but the RSV, the King James, and many others, I gave them commands causing their firstborn to, that I would defile them. Now God doesn't do that. Mm -hmm. We need to read the Bible through the prism of the Gospels. Mm -hmm. Well, now, having said all that, and realize that things are jumbled up here and sort of like this, 
Can we still read Jeremiah as an inspired book? Are these God's words or are these Jeremiah's words? There's so Careful. much quotation from, from God. It's, I mean, you go through it and just chapter after chapter is Jeremiah quoting God. Mm -hmm. So now I ask you to turn to Jeremiah 20, verses 7 to 14. Lord, you have deceived me, and I was deceived. You are stronger than I am, and you have overpowered me. Everyone jeers at me. They mock me all day long. Where, whenever I speak, I have to cry out and shout violence, destruction, because I proclaim, proclaim your message. But when I say, I will forget the Lord and no longer speak in his name, then your message is like a fire burning deep within me. I try my best to hold it back, but can no longer keep it back. I hear everybody whispering, terror is everywhere. Remember last week our lesson, there was someone called terror everywhere? Pasher? So let's report him to the authorities. Even my close friends wait for my downfall. Perhaps he can be tricked, they say. Then we will catch him and get revenge. But you, Lord, are on my side, strong and mighty, and those who persecute me will fa fail. They will be disgraced forever because they cannot succeed. Their disgrace will never be forgotten, and so forth. Um, are those God's words or are those Jeremiah's words? Like Jeremiah's. Yeah. Those are kind of like Jeremiah's words. So we have some uninspired stuff in here between the inspired stuff. Jeremiah was inspired, but these were his words, his feelings of uh, well, of, okay, of if you, depression. Yeah, if you were in Jeremiah's situation, what do you think you would be doing? His life had become a nightmare. He was ready to curse the day he was born. Are these words truthful? Do they sound even blasphemous? That's the way you felt. Well, why didn't Jeremiah keep quiet? What did he say? There's a you fire burning in my bones, right? You think when... When he expressed these feelings, do you think he lost credibility with those he was preaching to? <laughs> they, didn't want, they didn't want to believe anything he had to say from day one, so I'm not sure he could lose much more credibility. Well, there are other people who made statements similar. Look at Amos 3.8. When a lion roars, who can avoid being afraid? When the Sovereign Lord speaks, who can avoid proclaiming his message? So, what, what's Amos saying? Whether I want to or not, I have to speak what God tells me, right? Look at Paul in the New Testament, 1 Corinthians 9, 16. I have no right to boast just because I preach the gospel. After all, I'm under orders to do so. And how terrible it would be for me if I did not preach the gospel. Of course, the question is, how do you know? And we address that very slightly last. Mm -hmm. And the last lesson is, how do you know when God has uh, appointed you? Yeah. Well, let, let's be honest about a few things. Aren't we all, whether we like it or not, whether we recognize it or not, aren't we in the middle of maybe the final battle in the great controversy? Certainly hope so. <laughs> And let's be honest about something else. It's important to note that even the harshest critics of the Bible have to concede one important point. The Bible does not gloss over the human foibles of its most famous characters. You can no way you can say that the Bible is whitewashing its heroes. There's almost none of the Bible's heroes that don't have their sins spelled out. Does God allow us to cry out in pain when things aren't going well? Sure. How do we know that? He did it on the cross. He did it on the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Is he crying out? Or why am I forsaken yeah. by my people? 
Well, God certainly recognizes that we are all sin-damaged sin creatures. Look at these words from Ellen White. I have no merit or goodness whereby I may claim salvation, but I present before God the all-atoning blood of the spotless Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. This is my only plea. The name of Jesus gives me access to the Father. His ear, his heart is open to my faintest pleading, and he supplies my deepest necessities. That's from a sermon in 1892. Well, why did God allow Jeremiah to cry out like that and those words to be found in Scripture? I mean, he could have let Jeremiah cry out and just not included those words in the Bible, right? You know, keep your words to yourself, Jeremiah, you know. Well, look at this. What, what do you think about this? Here's, here's Jeremiah's cry. Curse the day I was born. Where are you reading from? Now, this is Jeremiah 20, verses 14 to 18. Curse the day I was born. Forget the day my mother gave me birth. Curse the one who made my father glad by bringing him the news. It's a boy. You have a son. May he be like those cities that the Lord destroyed without mercy. What cities did the Lord destroy without mercy? Sodom and Gomorrah, right? May he hear cries of pain in the morning and the battle alarm at noon because he didn't kill me before I was born. Then my mother's womb would have been my grave. Why was I born? Was it only to have trouble and sorrow to end my life in disgrace? Does that sound like a wonderful way to live? Well, once again, I'm going to ask this question. If we understand the great controversy, does it help us to live through times like that? We may intellectually know how God wants us to respond in those kind of circumstances, but it isn't always easy to do so, right? God is very sympathetic to our humanity. Do you think the day is coming when all of God's people will have Jeremiah-like or Job-like experiences? I think we'll all have some things, but some might have it worse than others, depending where you are in the world. God told Jeremiah to go down, look at, look at Jeremiah 18. We don't have time to read all 12 verses there, but he told him to go down to the potter. And what did he see the potter doing? Shaping clay, making something Shaping out. clay, and if it didn't work out right, what did he do? Roll it into a bowl, start, start over again. Then the Lord said to me, Haven't I the right to do with people, with you people of Israel, what the potter did with the clay? You are in my hands just like clay in the potter's hands. Does that mean we've lost our freedom? If at any time I say that I'm going to uproot, break down, or destroy any nation or kingdom, but then that nation turns from its evil, can you think of a nation that turned from its evil? Nineveh. Nineveh, sure. I will not do what I said I would. On the other hand, if I say that I'm going to plant or build up any nation or kingdom, but then that nation disobeys me and does evil, I will not do what I said I would. Now then, tell the people of Judah and of Jerusalem that I am making plans against them and getting ready to punish them. Tell them to stop living sinful lives, to change their ways and the things they are doing. So why is God telling them to change? I mean, that's not a complicated question. So he can work with them. So he can work with them. And what, what was their response? They will answer, this is God predicting in advance, they will answer, no, why should we? We will all be just as stubborn and evil as we want to be. How's that for a response when God tells you what he's going to do? Well, there's a very important biblical principle here. What do we call it? Conditional prophecy. What's conditional prophecy? The promises and the threatenings of the Lord are all conditional. Okay. What does that mean? Well, God gives you a warning, but if you turn around, the warning of doom is not likely to happen to you. Okay. 
like on or the in other the, hand, the, the flip, he, flip side. Yeah, if yeah. he says, "I will bless Israel," right. and Israel turns away, then what do? you know what could he do? Let him go. Did, did Jeremiah see that demonstrated in his life during his lifetime? Several times. Give me an example. The three destructions of Jerusalem. Yeah. Well, but look at look at his young years. Who was the king in Jeremiah's youth? Josiah. Josiah. What did what it what happened in Jeremiah's lifetime? God predicted all kinds of evils, and Jeremiah said, "I'm going to clean things up." Right? I'm going to. He, he traveled even into the northern kingdom, what used to be Israel. Josiah, and he, you're talking about Josiah. What did I say? Jeremiah. I am sorry, Josiah. Thank you. He traveled even to the northern kingdom, and he tore down the Asherah poles, and he cleaned up the. He got rid of the prophets of Baal. He burned them, their bones on, just as had been predicted about him. Burned their bones on the altars that they themselves had set up, and so forth and so forth. And what did God do to Josiah? God was pleased with him and assured him that he would not see the evils that are coming upon the people of Judah. So. What does that teach us about conditional prophecy? That it works. That it works. <laughs> okay. If people are willing to listen and change their ways, like Nineveh. God, like Nineveh, what does God do? He repents of the evil that he's, that he's threatened. On the other might, hand... You might get persecuted along the way. Yeah. Even swallowed by a whale? No. <laughs> God is always willing to forgive the sins of those who turn back to him. Wow. Was the prophecy discussed above in items number 9 and 10? That would be about Pasher. Against Pasher and his descendants, a conditional prophecy? Yes. How do we know? So here's the big question. How can we know when a prophecy is a conditional or not? Are there, uh, is every prophecy conditional? Is the second coming conditional? Ooh, that's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, maybe the timeliness of it may be conditional. As we've mentioned here, and it's based upon certain understandings we have within our theology that the Lord would have come ere this. Yeah. Had so... As Jim said, all... What did you say? All prophecies well, the and... Promises yeah. and threatenings of the, Lord, of the Lord are alike conditional. Yeah. Promises yeah. and threatenings. Yeah. But aren't, those is of anybody you, at this table sad that the Lord didn't come 100 years ago or 150 years ago? Me? You're sad? No, I, I'm sorry. The other way around. <laughs> I'm happy he did come. <laughs> okay, so, uh, so the, the, the infinite in his wisdom has got things under control. We should be encouraged. Why do people believe what they want to believe instead of the evidence, what the evidence shows is the truth? It's convenient. Self convenient. Are we ever guilty of doing that? What's that question again? Ask that question again. Why is it that people very often choose to believe what they want to believe instead of what the evidence supports? We approach most everything with a certain <coughs> level of presupposition or pre, you know, we have somewhat of our mind made up and it's very tough to change your mind based upon evidence. All the paradigm. Maybe we think Turning into a family group or the way you're raised or where you're economically well off. Why would you want to change? Maybe we think we believe in conditional prophecy, so we think <laughs> if we're a little more positive, upbeat, and have more faith, we can, we can change things. Well, there's a lot of evidence in Scripture suggesting that false prophets and false messiahs will come, especially at the end of time. Where would you find a message suggesting that? Matthew 24. Let's look at several of them. Matthew 24, verses 3 and 4. As Jesus sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him in private. Tell us when all this will be, they asked him. What will happen to show that it is the time for your coming and the end of the age? What's he talking about? The second coming. The second coming. 
Jesus answered, Be on your guard. That was his first comment. And do not let anyone deceive you. Many men claiming to speak for me will come and say, I'm the Messiah. And they will deceive many people. Drop down a ways. Look at, um, um, let's see, verse 11. Then many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Drop further down. Look at, uh, let's try verse 23 or 20, 23. Then if anyone says to you, look, here's the Messiah, or there he is, do not believe it. For false messiahs and false prophets will appear. They will perform great miracles and wonders in order to deceive even God's chosen people if possible. Listen, I've told you this before the time comes. Do we need to prepare ourselves? Yes. Uh, right now, I was watching, reading this last week in Russia. It's getting more attention in, uh, in the United States, but in Russia, there's uh, the Messiah is there and has pretty pretty large following. Yeah. Well, I mean, if you really believe somebody was the Messiah, wouldn't you follow him? Well, let me look at another place. Look at Deuteronomy 13. Prophets or interpreters of dreams may promise a miracle or wonder in order to lead you to worship and serve gods that you have not worshipped before. So, what are they trying to do? They're trying to get you to change gods, right? Even if what they promise comes true, do not pay any attention to them. The Lord your God is using them to test you to see if you love the Lord your God with all your heart. So, Just because someone makes a correct prediction, we, don't, we shouldn't believe them? That's right. Even, I mean, even if they make a, one correct prediction. I mean, what is it? Who was the lady that was supposed to be a prophet? Yeah. Dixon? Jean Dixon. Jean Dixon. Dixon what, they, 85, 75% or 65% of her predictions were true? What about the other 40%? <laughs> well, not all the prophecies in the Bible came true. They're conditional. <laughs> <laughs> Let me read you one talking about the end of days. Okay, look at Revelation 13. One of the heads of the beast seemed to have been fatally wounded, but the wound had healed. The whole earth was amazed and followed the beast. Now, Adventists have a certain... Keep going, it says, and the whole, the whole world yeah, worshipped I'm, the beast. I'm, yeah. yeah, everyone worshipped the dragon. And we, the chapter before, it, it told us exactly who the dragon is, right? Satan. And if the masses are going one direction, the majority is going one direction, where's truth? The other way. Everyone worshiped the dragon because he had given his authority to the beast. They worshiped the beast also, saying, who is like the beast? Who can fight against it? And then dropping down to verses 7 and 8. It was allowed to fight against God's people. So which side is he on? No question about it, right? And to defeat them. It was allowed to defeat them. And it was given authority over every tribe, nation, language, and race. Who's left out? All people, verse 8, all people living on earth will worship it except those whose names are written before the creation of the world in the book of the living which belongs to the lamb that was killed. That's pretty serious stuff, right? Well, look at Jeremiah 18. Verses 11 and 12. Now then, tell the people of Judah and of Jerusalem that I am making plans against them and getting ready to punish them. Tell them to stop living sinful lives, to change their ways and the things they are doing. And they will answer what? No. Why should we? We will all be just as stubborn and evil as we want to be. What do you do if you're God and that's the kind of response you get? Well, here's a comment from our, from our Bible study guide. The Lord then tells what he will do because of their disobedience. This is one of many places in the Bible that show that God's foreknowledge of our free choices in no way infringes upon those free choices. Now, you know, there's a lot of people who have serious questions about that. After all, why would the Lord have pleaded with them to turn from their evil if they didn't have the freedom to obey or disobey Him? Then, too, 
Why would he punish them for not obeying if they didn't have the freedom to obey? What's clear is that the Lord knew exactly what their free choices would be even before they made them. This crucial truth is also seen, for instance, in Deuteronomy 31, 16 to 21. We'll look at that in just a moment. Even before the children of Israel entered the promised land, the Lord tells Moses that he knows they will, quote, turn to other gods and worship them, Deuteronomy 31, 20. Here is more evidence that God's foreknowledge of our choices does not impinge on the freedom we have to make those choices. Looking back now at Deuteronomy 31, 16 to 18. The Lord said to Moses, You will soon die, and after your death the people will become unfaithful to me and break the covenant that I made with them. They will abandon me. Notice what this sequence once again. They will abandon me and worship the pagan gods of the land they are about to enter. When that happens, I will become angry with them. What happens? I will abandon them. What happens when God gets angry? Gives them up. He gives them up, and they will be destroyed. Many terrible diseases will come upon them, and then they will realize that these things are happening to them because I, their God, am no longer with them. And I will refuse to help them then because they have done evil and worshipped other gods. Well, Jeremiah said he couldn't keep quiet because of why? Fire in his bones. Fire in his bones. What does that mean? He couldn't just sit on his hands. He had Many years ago, doing it. I was living in Tanzania, working as a doctor and a pastor and teaching seminary students and so forth. And I gave a sermon that said, why I am a slave. And they uh, <laughs> looked at me a little surprised at that. But that's what Paul said, well, and that's basically what Jeremiah is saying here. He, he couldn't keep quiet. Paul says, I can't keep quiet. I said, I can't keep quiet. I can't keep quiet about what I believe. That's why I'm sitting here right now. Have you ever felt like there was, you out there, have you ever felt like there was a fire burning in your bones? Do you ever feel compelled to speak out on God's behalf? Do we need to speak on God's behalf? I mean, can't he speak for himself? He did 2,000 years ago. Yeah. And, people, and unfortunately, translators have messed, <laughs> messed it up several times. Yeah. But uh, in general, well, we, that's the only place we're going to find truth yeah. is in here. How can we, with the help of the Holy Spirit, form within ourselves a foundation based on Scripture that is so solid that we can't be deceived? Remember the verses read a little while ago? We don't want to be deceived. In light of the great controversy, could you explain to a fellow Christian who's going through a time of terrible suffering why such things happen? Or do you feel that we are simply chess figures being moved around on a board either by God or Satan? What do you think? I had the very interesting challenge one night of going to a late night party. I had serious questions whether I should even go because they were serving alcohol, but they were serving water and fruit juice and other things as well. So I, my wife and I went and after we'd been there just a few minutes, a lady turned to me that I didn't even know who she was. She said, do you consider yourself to be a missionary? And this was just after I'd come back from Zambia from our first tour overseas. And I was sort of... And you were in the United States. I was in the United States. This was in Baltimore, Maryland. And I was sort of gulp, 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 you know, what, what's he trying to get to? And I said, well, it depends on what you mean by being a missionary. He says, I don't give me that. He says, I want to know, do you consider yourself to be a missionary? And I said, well, yeah, I think so. Okay, I have a question for you. He says, if you're 500 miles away from a friend of yours, and it turns out this is a real story about one of her relatives, and that person is in a serious accident and they're in a coma, and you can't go to see them or do anything for them, if you pray for them, will it do any good? 
And that's exactly the kind of question you expect to get at a cocktail party, right? Mm -hmm. Every day. <laughs> well, it, tend, it turned out that um, those discussions went on for a while, and that young lady ended up being a professor at Loma Linda University. And that was the first question. And later she told me, you know, is I, for seven years I've asked everybody I could get, get the attention of that same question. You're the first person who gave me a reasonable answer. And of course, what do, you, what do you think my answer was? I said, well, let me tell you about the great controversy. And I said, but that's going to take a while. She says, we've got all night. <laughs> she, just, she was a quite a character. But what is it, what's what's the difference between somebody now getting back to the the fire and the bones? Yeah. Some people feel from early on they've been called. They can't get away from it. But yeah. that's not all of us. No. Or should it be? Well, no. I mean, not everybody feels exactly we. All of us are called to witness, but That's some may some may just feel compelled. Other may, people do it because it's you know they talk to their friends, but they don't they don't have a sort of fire burning in their bones. And not everybody has a complete is completely knows compelled. well no, no, not. not not completely compelled. Not everybody knows everything completely. Yeah, That's everybody has in their message has something that's, that isn't quite perfect because we're always learning. Yeah. The Christian church has a long history of being persecuted. Tertullian in North Africa in A.D. 197 wrote a little book called The Apologetica, trying to defend Christianity. This was in the days, remember, when Christianity was illegal. In that message he said, the blood of the martyrs is a seed of the church. Do you think that might be true? Yeah. Why? There's kind of a nice statement here in, in Romans 10, 9 and 10. Because you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For man believes with his heart and is so justified and he confesses with his lips and so is saved. Confessing with your lips mm -hmm. or, in other words, you're telling somebody else. You're not with, just keeping witnessing, it private. Yeah. You're witnessing. Verbal right? witness. It's relatively yes. simple. But he also says you've got to incorporate everything you can about him, uh, and you'll, you'll remember you in the resurrection. So Have the courage of your convictions. Yeah. Let me turn back and read a couple of verses that we read earlier. Before you do, you ask the question, is the seat of the church, is uh, the blood of the martyrs the seat of the church? Yeah. If so, why? If you, in a time of persecution, if you're a part of the group being persecuted, you have conviction that that's correct. Yeah. And if you have conviction, you're going to share it. That's right. It's not a mediocre. You're not going to be mediocre under those you're circumstances. You're not just sitting and riding in the bus and hoping it's heading for the kingdom. You're not in Laodicea yeah. and, uh, right. during persecution. And also, those who disagree with you or don't like you uh, become focused on you, mm -hmm. and uh, so therefore you have no choice. But people to be, and and, and wherever and, and, you are, have, yeah. it, it it becomes uh, an unavoidable witness. Yeah. And, and and there's another side to that, a very interesting side. People tend to dissect everything you say, and if you're representing God correctly, that's going to impact them. Well, on April 18 of 1521, Martin Luther was standing trial before Emperor Charles V at the Imperial Diet of Worms in what today is Germany. He was being commanded to recant his writings. While we do not know for sure that he said at that time of his trial, those famous words that some have quoted, here I stand, I can do no other, God help me. We, can't, we do know that he said near the, near the end, uh, said this near the end of his speech, unless I am convinced by the testimony of the Holy Scriptures or by evident reason, for I can believe neither Pope nor councils alone, as it is clear that they have erred repeatedly and contradicted themselves, I consider myself convicted by the testimony of Holy Scripture, 
which is my basis, my conscience is captive to the Word of God, thus I cannot and will not recant, because acting against one's conscience is neither safe nor sound. God help me. Amen. Isn't this a statement about someone who has a fire in his bones? Amen. Yep. Was he entirely correct? No, you didn't have to ask that question. <laughs> in his theology. He was moving in the right direction. He definitely was moving in the right direction. He was doing more than baby steps. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, how would you compare the troubles of Jeremiah with the troubles of Job? Sort of in the same ballpark? Job, of course, didn't know why those things happened to him. Jeremiah had been warned, right? And he had so, the history of Job. Yeah. So when trials come upon us, it is, all, is it all right to cry out? Let's not forget the words. We've mentioned this once, but let me just read them for you. Matthew 27, 46. Jesus is on the cross, and he, he says what? About 3 o'clock, Jesus cried out with a loud shout, Eli, Eli, lema sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why did you abandon me? Well, unfortunately, many of our Christian friends believe that God is so above us, so far sovereign up there, that nothing that we ever do or say could impact him any way. But it seems clear from the book of Job and now from the book of Jeremiah here that things that we do and say do impact God. Can you name other prophets who felt discouraged and at the end of the rope? What about Elijah at Mount Horeb? But what does God say, and let's end with this, Romans 8, 28. We know that in all things God works for good. Even in the situation of Job, even in the situation of Jeremiah, for those who love him, who, those whom he has called according to his purposes. Let's pray. Our kind and fa loving Father, as we look at these examples of your faithful followers, your faithful prophets of long ago, may it give us courage to realize that difficult times may be still coming ahead of us. In fact, we know they are. We know that the devil is going to throw at us everything he possibly can as the, as the end of time approaches. But we can take courage from what you have promised in your word, that if we are faithful to your word, you will not allow us to be destroyed by the devil. And we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen.